I am live again. Hey friends, so I'm going for a record here, three videos in one day, actually in 24 hours. Um, yesterday I did a couple of videos on the ketogenic diet and, and uh, as it pertains to athletic performance and some related topics. And I did an intro video that actually didn't record the audio. And so the two videos that I posted yesterday kind of pick up uh, with some kind of missing uh, information. Um, so I'm going to do a quick prologue and then kind of a postscript to those videos and just kind of introduce you to what I was talking about a little more clearly and also kind of go through some um, both kind of myths, kind of what we know is true and what we're still learning. And um, some of the sort of fallacies and misunderstandings that are going on in this discussion of low carbohydrate ketogenic like diets and athletic performance. This also is very relevant, of course, to, to all of us in terms of, uh, you know, how should we eat to maximize our, our health potential? And so, as I discussed already, I was talking about the, um, the, the targeted ketogenic diet and the cyclic ketogenic diet, and then just uh, there's also this topic kind of comes into fasting and exercise as well as just a true, uh, you know, ketogenic diet in terms of your athletic performance. And so um, I, you know, this topic has come up, I guess, mainly because this is uh, near and dear to me. I am obviously been advocating for the ketogenic diet and studying it and following the new research that's coming out. I'm also a an amateur athlete and I'm also 51 years of age and I am trying to maximize health and, uh, you know, have more time to enjoy life, stay active and have a little competitive fun out there. And so I've been following a number of discussions that are going on online, uh, various websites and uh, YouTube channels. And uh, one in particular has caught my interest this season because uh, it's that of uh, regarding uh, training schedules and things like that. It's actually a great site I'll, uh, or a great channel. I'm going to link to it in the description below. And uh, this guy's, uh, you know, a, a veteran athlete. Um, he's very knowledgeable. He's a trainer, personal trainer, and um, a lot of good, good information. And, and so I want to make sure I'm mentioning him. I'm going to link to definitely check out his stuff. I'm going to offer a little bit of a different perspective than recently came up uh, from one of his posts and a few of his videos on, on nutrition for athletes in regards to both fasting, low carbohydrate diets and a ketogenic diet. And based on his, some of his ideas and conclusions, and then the comments of some of the people who uh, watched and commented, I feel like I want to offer a, a perspective that we consider in this. Um, and one that we don't throw out new information and, and new diets. Uh, we are entering into the phase with the ketogenic diet that it has grown in so much popularity that you're having a lot of different ways people are doing it. You're having lots of people uh, posting non-information, really unverified and unsubstantiated claims on perhaps both sides. And, um, and I, I guess I would start with this. Be careful um, when you're listening to information and research is thrown about and referenced. Um, there's kind of a fallacy in thought and in scientific thought and in critical thinking and, and where we can practice what's kind of known as selective you know, research referencing. Um, research is simply observations um, that are tested and in very, there's many different types of research studies. Um, we are overwhelmed with the amount of research that's available. And so number one, um, PubMed, which is kind of the online database for most of the research, or at least a lot of it, is often where we go to search up. And a couple of problems with that. One is that it's not going to often have new research, especially if it's not been published yet. It also, um, it's also likely that when you go to search, that's a whole science in and of itself to try to be able to search up appropriate research that's relevant to what you're looking for. And you can quickly go through review articles. You can look at where they've actually studied other studies and they kind of come to a summary statement. And it's easy to 
overinterpret conclusions that are given. So, and and just kind of to summarize what where this pertains to what I'm talking about is is we have historically um, research, lots of research that's been done on how to fuel athletes of various kinds. And there's the idea that um, we are carb burners and athletes do better when primarily fed carbohydrates. Um, that is true. Those research studies are obviously, you know, it's been very, very well verified. Um, on the other hand, as we enter into the low carbohydrate field of study, comparatively, those studies are very small, and especially with athletes, they're starting to come out and they've been out for many years, you can find them and reference them. And that leads me to kind of explain my perspective on this in terms of athletic performance. My perspective and my history is about three and a half years studying the ketogenic diet as it pertains mainly to older adults. Um, there's a lot of evidence actually going back in its use for children in terms of epilepsy. It's been um, you know, looked at for neuroprotective effects. And so on this topic of athletic performance, often we have sort of the athletic field and um, advocates and athletes. And the mindset is often, how do we maximize athletic performance? I want to do this and I want to be as fast as I can. Um, nothing wrong with that, but when you look at studies that are looking at that, often they are a couple, there's a few things going on. One is that they typically are younger adults. You know, typically average age might be in their 20s, um, early to mid 20s. Um, most of the feeding studies are often done in a very short term type of situation where you're literally um, feeding these athletes a particular meal for a, a couple of days or even less. Um, you feed them a certain way and then you test their athletic performance. And so when they've compared higher carbohydrate diets or traditional carbohydrate fueling and low carbohydrate diets, it's often a very short um, duration study. And we now know very clearly that for really adequately studying the benefits of a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, you need to allow for keto adaptation as it's called. And this takes weeks. Um, I actually pulled up uh, a few studies that I'll reference as I'm talking about this. And uh, the other thing I want to be clear about is that my perspective is that's great if you want to have athletic success. I, I help my patients do that. I want to have that. But there's, I think we have two different goals going on here. It's, you know, great if you want to achieve success as a 25 year old athlete. But what about when you're 55? Are you doing things as an athlete that are actually breaking the body down more? At a, so is there a cost for you to engage in that? Um, and we're talking primarily about dietary choices that, yes, you may be faster today, but are you increasing your risk for oxidative damage later in life or that's cumulative in terms of the brain? Um, it's fairly clear that low carbohydrate and even calorie restricted like diets, uh, clinical fasting, et cetera, there is a longevity element. In other words, animals and humans live longer when you are on a more carbohydrate restricted um, way of eating overall. Um, I, you know, being now 51, I have a young children still. Um, I have a, a job, I have life. so. I like to ride bikes and race and have fun and also be competitive, but I also don't want to wear out my joints. I don't want to um, increase my oxidative stress and sort of the free radical damage that exercise inevitably has. Exercise is stress. Exercise is not that much different from emotional stressors in terms of their impact on some of the negative side. Now, exercise has many, many benefits, of course, but we're balancing this equation in our bodies in terms of exercise and these training programs. We want to break down and build resilience and then rebuild and be stronger. But this balance, if you are primarily a carb and using refined, especially refined carbohydrates in a traditional Western diet in terms of, you know, carbs are treated as equal and you just feel whatever you like, go ahead and eat that. You're the athlete, you know, carb load, use, you know, sh sugar and gels and whatever to, um, you know, feed the engine. But it is absolutely clear. I think, you know, I won't spend a lot of time pulling out all the research, but you just look up 
in, in PubMed and online on this topic, and you will see the many degenerative diseases that are associated with the increased use of refined carbohydrates and sugar. This applies to athletes. I mean, if you're burning tons of calories and so you're not gaining weight and you're, you are having success in building muscle, I have had many, many patients as they start to uh, approach uh, when they're in their 30s and 40s and beyond, you're starting to see adrenal burnout. You're seeing multiple endocrine reduction and um, declines. The body's beginning to break down. Um, I want to be 65 and still pedaling around and moving around. And so I think the question, to bring this back around, is that I, I think in fairness, we may be all uh, – talking about two different things when you see controversy around the low carbohydrate diets and, and athletic performance. Nobody's arguing that using a traditional model of carb fueling doesn't work. I mean, it works, it fuels athletes. You may even see top sprint times, um, but this is new information. And I would love to see as some very well run nutrition programs and nutritionists and trainers are working with, let's say a Tour de France team, and, and they get these guys adapted and then they use targeted carbohydrate fueling healthy sources and, and really do a comparison. I mean, that's one of the ultimate endurance sports. It's mixed with some sprints and things like that. They have different levels of measuring success in that race. But on, on, at, a, at the end of the day, you want to be the fastest top of the uh, pack. And, um, and it, so it's, a, it's an ultimate endurance kind of a sport. Anyway, that has yet to be done. Um, you're seeing a shift. Um, some many, many endurance, I shouldn't say many, there are a handful of endurance athletes that are at the top of the class that are using an appropriate, well-studied and professionally guided uh, ketogenic-like diets in, an, in a way that makes sense for the athlete. And so it's, it's a different kind of a diet and a different approach than say somebody who's just trying to treat a uh, neurodegenerative disease or somebody trying to lose weight. So it's the ketogenic diet is not as simple as here you go, because a lot of the negative and naysaying that's going online has to do with the person who just looked up the information. I do the keto diet. Oh, it didn't work for me. Um, you know, a couple, you know, you have to, <laughs> let's be fair about this. The ketogenic diet has one goal. If you're going to call it a ketogenic diet in terms of initial goal, and that is, are you in ketosis? If you never mention, if you never measure your ketones, you have no idea, or it's only theoretical. Um, and so, it's it's not that difficult. The diet, the programs, they're out there. There's tons of um, guidance on this. But again, you have to be knowing what to look for and to be measuring, or you know, you can't dismiss it. Many people take weeks and weeks to keto adapt. Many people take a long period of time to understand and ap apply the diet consistently enough. Um, the tool of exogenous ketones is very, very helpful as well, especially in these settings where you don't do the diet completely, but you're looking for some help and fat adaptation. But um, let's see. So I'll just go through a couple of things that are obvious um, to me. And as I've looked through the data, um, I'm going to bring up a screen share here. If you just bear with me, uh, let us see where we go to. Oh, it's always. Uh, I I'm struggling with the uh, every time I use YouTube to stream, I get a different view. Uh, and I don't see how to screen share. So I may have to just post some links to this, but I'm going to go ahead and um, reference some of this. Let's see, what is this here? No. Nope. Yeah, I think the problem is, is I was using um, Hangouts via YouTube, and it had an easy screen share, but boy, it is not. They've taken away my link to be able to do that. Uh, let's see, toggle time soon. I can't do it there. Um, in any case, I'll go through and I'll post these in the link. So um, I'll go through a couple of studies and I apologize if this is, you know, when you have somebody reading something and it's a very short couple of couple excerpts. This is from the um, Sports Medicine uh, 2018 October. Uh, substrate metabolism during Ironman triathlon, different horses on the same courses. 
uh, Mander et al. is the author. Um, and just an excerpt. So it is proposed that the performance level of the Ironman athlete is considered uh, when adopting metabolic strategies to minimize the endogenous carbohydrate cost associated with exercise at competitive intensities. Um, that's kind of saying, we know that these high endurance competitions and in these athletes require a very high demand of continual carbohydrate, carbohydrate repletion. And of course they're burning up. What's limiting their ability to perform is going to be how fast they're using up their internal carbohydrate stores. Um, so uh, let's specifically periodize training with low carbohydrate availability, AKA training in a low carbohydrate status or a ketogenic like state combined with exogenous carbohydrate supplementation during competition. That is like the targeted keto diet essentially. Uh, might be most appropriate for elite and top amateur Ironman athletes who elicit very high rates of energy expenditure. Um, conversely, the adoption of a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet might be appropriate for some lower performance amateurs in whom associated um, high rates of fat oxidation may be almost completely sufficient to match the energy demands required. So what that's saying is that there's likely a benefit of getting the body used to using fats more efficiently in a low carbohydrate like state um, through the training process and going into your athletic performance in the amateur athlete where you're not trying to be at an even higher uh, level. It's um, it's saying that, you know, really a consistent low carbohydrate diet is maybe the very best uh, might be the best way to go about that, you know, to prevent a number of issues, including, um, uh, you know, all of the oxidative damage, the inevitable breakdown, um, and really getting through it. And, you know, when we talk about an Ironman, we're looking at hours, you know, a 12 hour kind of day. <laughs> so, um, then another study in the journal of sports medicine, physiology, fitness, uh, 2018, April 4th. Uh, these are all within the last year here. Um, so 16 men and women, uh, average age of 23. So here we have, of course, that young group of young athletes participated in randomized sequence counterbalance crossover study in which they underwent exercise testing for four days of either a low carbohydrate or a ketogenic diet. Um, the point of this was just to show, well, one, their conclusion was that the ketogenic diet was less superior um, than the traditional carbohydrate rich diet. Um, and, and of course, the obvious point here to underline and accent was that this, the day duration of four days. <laughs> so that has clearly been demonstrated to be inefficient to produce ketosis in athletes and um, there's no controversy there. So that's the kind of study that we're seeing cited still by the carb promoters. Um, and again, in balance, I don't, um, I'm not disagreeing with the research on carbohydrate use and athletic performance, but it is really not a fair assessment of low carb ketogenic diets to be referencing these studies that were completely inadequate. Um, now, this one's fascinating to me. This was actually published in Nutrients back in 2014 uh, by Adam Zijak et al. Um, the effects of the ketogenic diet on exercise metabolism and physical performance in off-road cyclists, so near and dear to my heart. Um, what's fascinating about this is that, that they focused on polyunsaturated fatty acids, which... Uh, we actually know now that when you are in ketosis, you are burning saturated and monounsaturated fats primarily. Uh, polyunsaturated would be the last choice as the body starts to pick and choose what fats to break down. Polyunsaturated fats have many important uses in the body, but that should not be, you, the goal of a ketogenic diet is not to get as much polyunsaturated fats. Now their diet breakdown actually was a pretty balanced fat intake. There was probably, I think it was 20, 20% saturated, 18% or maybe 18% saturated, 20% monounsaturated, and then the balance, uh, blah, 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 it came to, there was some other types of fatty acids, of course, but it was, there, there was really kind of equal amounts between the saturated, monounsaturated and polyunsaturated intake. 
Uh, let's see, the ketogenic diet stimulated favorable changes in body mass and body composition. We know that, um, as well as the lipid and lipoprotein profiles. We also know that, aka that means it improves your cardiovascular lipid profile. Uh, important findings of this present study include significant increase in relative values of maximal oxygen uptake and oxygen uptake at lactate, lactate threshold after the ketogenic diet. Um, that also is not new, um, or it is, it kind of confirms new, newer studies as well, is that there's an improved O2 oxygen utilization. It's kind of a VO2 max, of course, in the lactate threshold. Um, uh, so in other words, the body becomes better adapted to be able to use oxygen more efficiently. We know that beta oxidation and the use of ketone bodies uh, yields higher energy output per unit of oxygen, less reactive oxygen species, and kind of an improved lactate utilization, improved uptake. Um, now, there is some assumption that this is happening, as they concluded, I think, in a, incorrectly, as we know now. Um, it, it's not that your lactate threshold is lower because you're eating less carbohydrates and therefore have less glucose. Um, we see it, and studies have demonstrated both looking at actual muscle biopsies and the glycogen stores and the utilization of lactate is that there's an improved preserving of glycogen and a, an improved recycling of lactate. And so it's an efficiency improvement. It's not that there's actually less. I think we, we can say that, um, that this assumption that glycogen is deficient in the low carb ketogenic athlete is not correct. We know that after adaptation, there is a sparing effect on glycogen and you can look at the uh, levels and you see that they become once adapted nearly the same. And so you literally, you can preserve and have as much glycogen in a ketogenic diet athlete um, as you do in a high carb athlete, the body adapts and it's just using less of it. And it's also better at regenerating it. Uh, let's see. The effects of this was, uh, that was let's see. Okay. Um, this was interesting. Um, in that art, same article, they quoted another article. And this is where that assumption came from. So low carbohydrate ketogenic diets decrease the ability to perform high intensity work due to decreased glycogen muscle stores and the lower activity of glycolytic enzymes, which is evidenced by a lower lactate concentration and a maximal workload during the last 15 minutes of high intensity stage of the exercise protocol. They reference uh, fat adaptation for athletic performance, the nail in the coffin written in 1985 in the Journal of Applied Physiology. Uh, I have not read that whole article, but judging by the title, I can imagine what they're, what they're talking about. Um, what number one, 1985, I mean, seriously, here we are in 2018, um, 19, excuse me, and we're, we have a lot more information on the keto adaptation process and how that, what that looks like. We also know, as I just got through saying, that the lactate threshold, uh, VO2 max, um, the actual muscle levels of glycogen and the preserving, the preserving effect is clear and we understand the um, kind of the pathways of how that's happening. So long story short is that bring this around this particular study was actually very good. I think it, it actually favorably demonstrated what we know about the ketogenic diet. It also demonstrates how if we take these athletes and we do the targeted ketogenic diet, um, we're, we're starting to see this um, balance between the two. You know, it's not good and bad. It's sort of like you've got people promoting high fat, you've got people promoting the carbohydrates, and really, um, why are there two poles to this discussion? Why not use both? We are like, again, the hybrid car. Human beings have the ability to burn, burn, burn fats and carbohydrates. The problem is, is if, you, if you stay in a carb zone all of your life, your fat burning system goes largely to sleep. If you train your metabolism and give what we refer to as kind of a metabolic flexibility, you're tapping into the best of both worlds. And so targeted ketogenic diets allow for appropriate application of carbohydrates to the athlete, given what he needs to do after enduring, he's been able to fat adapt and, and ketogenically adapt anyway. So, uh, 
the it's the list is long. So I guess I'll just wrap up by saying that again on the discussion, let's make sure we're talking about do we want our 25 year old athletes, if this is you or if it's your child or again your teenager, um, these people that especially want to be high achiever and and um, you know high, you know elite athletes. What's the story when they're in their late 30s, 40s, and 50s? Do you want um, to see increased neurodegenerative diseases? Uh, I could go on and on about the uh, the benefits of utilizing a ketogenic diet appropriately. It's a, it's a seasonal diet. It's a diet that, depending on where you are in your training and competitive yearly cycle, um, you need to adjust it accordingly. Um, so I will put a few links down in the description below. Um, Let's see. So just remember this in the discussion. It's it's. Let's think about what age group we're talking about and what our goals are. Um, but it's undeniable the neuroprotective effects of the low carbohydrate diets. Um, and then lastly, I'll just say it's really interesting to me because I've experienced this myself. But the muscle hypertrophy, this muscle preserving and benefits that you see um, for the low carbohydrate diets. A lot of new studies are showing how the HDAC, um, the histone deacetylase enzymes inhibition has a lot of the neurological and muscle preserving activity and the benefits we see, a reduction in reactive oxygen species. Um, mTOR, uh, which is another signaling molecule uh, that breaks down tissues and cells in the body, especially associated with muscle breakdown. And that's been a big deal for these, especially endurance athletes and all of us as to where we're trying to preserve muscle. Um, we break down muscle, we get stronger, but when you become competitive and it's very easy to overtrain and to see increasing fatigue, muscle decline, and, and especially as you get to be older, you, preserving muscle becomes a little more difficult. And what's remarkable is that people not only live longer, shed a few pounds, they build muscle and preserve it by utilizing this. And so um, I'm going to call that a wrap. I think for now, I appreciate this one on a little bit longer, but I just wanted to kind of go through a few things and to kind of differentiate and hope that we can all stay with an open mind and keep learning. And um, again, I'll just conclude. Uh, for those of you who maybe not uh, seen my videos before, know nothing about me, I'm a naturopathic physician. I am you can Google that if you have no idea what naturopathic physicians are. We are um, licensed and uh, for your medical degrees, I've spent the last decade doing that with a previous uh, degree in nutrition and really studying both, um, you know, cooking cuisine and as it relates to human nutrition for the last, geez, 20 plus years. I definitely don't have all the information here, but um, critical thinking, let's examine the evidence. And, and then I've lived it out for three and a half years and um, I will continue to use low carbohydrate diets to my advantage so that uh, again, I maximize health. So thank you again. So please subscribe if you liked and uh, thumbs up always is nice. And uh, you know, feel free to post and forward, um, ask your questions. And I look forward to carrying on this discussion with you into the future. Thanks for watching.